consistent with our mission to bring the past to the present and plan for the future. Our keynote speaker today, Dr. Arita Crowell, will be speaking about um, mental health in Los Angeles County. Dr. Arita has been involved in California's mental health system for more than 40 years, working both with public policy and service delivery arenas. She has served in the State of California Department of Health Services and as the Director of San Diego County Health Services. She is also, uh, she also was the Director of the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health where she was responsible for 1,300 employees contracted with more than 100 local provider agencies and oversaw an annual operating budget of $474 million. Dr. Kral is with us today. Um, to present uh, mental health, mental health programs, public mental health programs in LA County, the past, the present, and the future. Dr. Crow? Obviously, the past of public mental health goes far before the Department of Mental Health. And yet, I think I was asked because of writing the history book to really concentrate on the Department of Mental Health history. But what goes before? Obviously, the state hospitals, the Bureau of Social Work, where Jim Carls uh, worked. Um, that later became the Office of Mental Health Social Services. That was community mental health in action long before uh, a Department of Mental Health was even envisioned. There were uh, child guidance clinics, like the Los Angeles Child Guidance Clinic, which is so close to USC here and has a strong connection with U USC. That was started in 1923. So we had public mental health services. Probably the most prominent in the community were the county hospitals, and they had outpatient psychiatry clinics, and Big County had the inpatient program. The past of public mental health owes a lot to Francis Feldman. That, the department was started as a result of the passage in 1957 of the Lanterman Pet, uh, I'm sorry, the Short Doyle Act. And Francis and her husband and her brother, Dr. Jack Lomas, were active in getting that law passed. And then they were active in getting a department established here in Los Angeles County because the Short Doyle Act was voluntary. Nobody required a county to have a mental health program. All that was required was state hospitals. A lot of counties did not act on that until they were required to in 1969 in the passage of LPS. But Francis was one of those who wanted to see it happen in Los Angeles and went to work as Francis could. You will find um, some of her thoughts about this and because of the history I want to read from her thoughts that are in the book. It's on page 31 for anybody who has it. One of her first tasks was to do speaking. She was talking to the Pasadena Women's Civic Club. And this would be 1958, 59, to explain the importance of a short doyle program in Los Angeles County. Early in the session, a woman rose to protest that such a department would make it possible for mental health people to come to a citizen's home in the dead of night and transport him to the wilds of Alaska, much in the fashion of communists in Russia. After all, everyone knows that psychiatrists are communists. Why Alaska? Well, it happened that Alaska was then a United States territory, and Congress had under consideration a bill to fund the establishment of a neuropsychiatric institute in Anchorage. Why communism? Well, there had been many hearings going on in the community where they, um, there had been a lot of effort to identify people with communism. Quote, momentarily I was taken aback by this outburst and the affirmative nodding of heads accompanying it. Now I recognize some of the women from hearings held by the city council or the board of supervisors where they identified themselves as minute women and spewed vitriol about fluoridation and other issues. Among my teaching areas was the development of health and welfare policy in the United States. So I now asked if the audience knew of Benjamin Rush, signer of the Constitution. Oh yes, they chanted. Did they know he was an early psychiatrist? 
often called the father of American psychiatry, and had worked closely with Benjamin Franklin in separating the mentally ill from people imprisoned for crime. I forbode mentioning that he was a believer in the use of leeches. While I am dubious that some of these ladies were converted to the cause of mental health, I was permitted to present my views without further similar outbursts, and the questions of some led me to believe they truly had listened. So there's our Francis at work. <laughs> I was interested to see just now in the, the USC social work history book that is at our tables, uh, which is a very impressive, much more glamorous and um, new age than, than our county publication. But I noticed there the emphasis on the McCarthy era and the, the role of, of the uh, anti-communists um, in our whole social policy. And it, you know, it was the same thing happening. Well, anyway, finally, Los Angeles did authorize the, the establishment of a mental health department. They started off by authorizing, authorizing a mental health advisory board uh, quite a while before they actually met. They met in 1959. And once again, these same connections, Dr. Jack Lomas chaired the advisory board. He did so for 12 years, so he was still chair when I came to the department in 1966. Um, so they created a department. The, que the question then was, would it be part of the Department of Charities, which ran the big county hospital, or would it be a separate department? It was created as a separate department to keep an eye on those very suspicious people, because they were all not sure of what this mental health thing was all about. They had a lot of questions. It actually passed on a three to one vote. Any of you who watch the Board of Supervisors know that's not an auspicious beginning. You, and Dr. Brickman, who was the first director, Dr. Harry Brickman, was always aware that he had been taught you have to go into an issue knowing whether you can get your three votes before you bring it to the board, because if you can't, you're in deep trouble. So at the time the department was established, there were outpatient services at all of you, Harbor, and the medical center. There were alcohol treatment services at Acton and Warm Springs for men. There was a mental health department at the Superior Court, which certified people for commitment to the state hospitals. That's all there was. So what was the department going to do? Let me read what Dr. Brickman said about his goals for the department. And this is quoting from 1965. 6,000 Los Angeles residents were admitted to state hospitals in 1964. Can you imagine that? Think of our population, which was about five or six million. We don't have anything like those numbers in treatment even today. A network of regional clinics was planned to dramatically reduce that number. We hope to develop our program to the point where no county resident will require state hospitalization and we should be able to do it for less money, said Dr. Brickman in February 1965. Our main goal is to reduce the development of chronic disability. In the intervening time between the founding of the department and that quote, the department had grown to 12 locations, 30 services, uh, and a budget of six and a half million dollars, of which the state provided four million. You just heard that when I retired, the county budget was nearly half a billion. Today, the annual county budget, any of you guess? One and a half billion. That includes money we'll be talking about later. Uh, cost of living and increase of services. We are still very aware of what we can't do that we know we ought to do, even with that money, but think how little it was. Programs were started very gradually in the 60s to get enough money from the Board of Supervisors. I remember speaking to a group in, in New York uh, as they were planning community services, and that was in 1969, and they couldn't believe how few services we had at that time. Community services in California were late in development. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go through a few quick highlights. The 60s saw the development of clinics. One of the most notable was the East Los Angeles Mental Health Clinic. 
Margarita Mendez, who's in your book and in the Hall of Fame, and Armando Morales were social workers who worked with Dr. Marv Carno to prove that Hispanic people would come to use community mental health services if they were culturally competent. We didn't use those words in those days, but that's what that, that clinic was. And it demonstrated it. It put to rest national myths about whether there was a, an incidence of mental illness in the Hispanic population that was comparable to other populations and what kinds of services they needed. That was a, a landmark program. 1963, the Federal Community Mental Health Center Act was passed. Implementation of that in Los Angeles was, like almost everything else, somewhat controversial. The law called for catchment areas to meet a certain population requirement. There would have been 55 catchment areas in Los Angeles County, and the idea was that you would have comprehensive, complete services from inpatient to outpatient to consultation and everything else for all ages. We did a calculation of what it would cost to implement a sample program like that across Los Angeles County and concluded that it would be many, many more times than we could project, uh, even more than we could project today. So the county applied to, do, to get federal money for community mental health centers on a combined catchment basis that would correspond to the usual health planning districts uh, in the county. The federal government through their Region 9 representatives refused. So it then came up to local nonprofit agencies to apply for to get federal community mental health center funds. Only a few actually did that. Meanwhile, in Northern California, the Bay Area counties jumped on that bandwagon and every one of them applied for and got federal money to start community mental health centers at the rate that they called for in the federal legislation. That established a disparity of funding between the North and the South, which exists to this day. Uh, I finally, at one point in my career in the department, said, well, what are we going to do? Let's try getting federal money. We'll just say we're going to serve one catchment area. So what are they going to do? And we actually started three more uh, community mental health centers under county auspices with that kind of approach. So that helped a little bit. We put one of them in San Gabriel, which had been very underfunded relatively, and again remains relatively underfunded in terms of population need. Uh, once you get started on an inequitable distribution of resources, it's very hard uh, to make any adjustment. The 60s were also a time for social workers to remember that that was the time of the MD at ease. No one but an MD could become a mental health director. The social workers in our clinics used to complain that they'd get in new psychiatrists, young psychiatrists who had no training in dealing with the county population and they had to train them up. They got pretty resentful of that. 1969, the huge change came with the passage of Latterman Petra Short and with it, the uh, limitations on involuntary commitment. It was intended as a correction for far too easy involuntary commitment, which had been the case before. It was also modeled on the successes of the, of the county hospital in seeing people before they went to the hospital and diverting them to other services. And they thought that by putting the counties required to do a screening before the person could go to the state hospital, that they would have that effect. They would be able to do the diversion. And that's reflected in what Dr. Brickman said in 65. Now this law wasn't passed, wasn't effective until 69. The other thing that happened at about that time was Department of Mental Health was merged into the Department of Health Services, which had been the Department of Hospitals before that, and several health-related activities were merged into one department. It was another time of controversy. Mental health people didn't want to be merged, and as it turned out, it didn't work very well for mental health. We were at that time funded with state allocations on an annual basis. What you didn't spend went back to the state. And what we found was that because of unilateral across the board administrative actions taken by the Department of Health Services, vacancies weren't filled and other authorized activities couldn't be implemented. So we were returning money, which we all considered pretty disastrous when we knew how much unmet need there was in the community. List Witherell, who was the director of that combined department, and I remain friends and colleagues, and we laughed together, and his 
quote in the, depart in the history book says, mental health represented only 10% of the operation in terms of personnel and money, but we were 35% of his problems. <laughs> well, we finally uh, got enough protest from the Mental Health Advisory Board. The Advisory Board said, no, no, we're not going to be neglected like this. Um, and they finally called, they refused to uh, uh, pass the county plan. And that created a crisis with the Board of Supervisors, which led to the separation of a separate department. During the years of merger and the frustration led to the resignation of Dr. Brickman, Dr. Herb Robinson, Dr. Hal Maverick were interim directors, but the DHS was not appointing anyone on a permanent basis. So all of those things contributed to the unrest in the mental health community calling for a separation again. And that department was reestablished in 1984, and Dr. Richard Elpers became that director at that time and stayed until um, 84, 90, um, 86, I'm sorry, 78 to 84, get my dates right here. That effort to uh, merge mental health into health services has not gone away. It has been raised several times in the intermediate, intermediate years, and I expect it will happen again. Uh, there are reasons. It was a very appealing uh, argument in the first place. After all, we do know that mental health is part of health. It's fundamental to health, and therefore, uh, we should be able to treat people as whole people and do this together. But frankly, nobody has yet found a very good way to make that happen. And we are struggling all around uh, California, around the country, people trying very hard to make it happen. Administrative merger is not necessarily the way to go. So I would uh, urge great caution the next time that one comes up. Uh, we move on then to uh, the 70s, state hospital closures began. The first, Modesto was closed in 1970, DeWitt in 72. Budget problems began then, and they have been never ending. I remember my disillusionment when the state director of, of then mental hygiene told us that we shouldn't worry about our county budgets because we were getting an increase in dollars. That at a time when the cost of living was, was uh, really quite high, and the increase of dollars represented maybe 1%, so it was a net loss. Bureaucratic doublespeak was my first dose of it, and of course we never have seen the end. Prop 13 passed in 1978. That led to more problems for local government. We had been suffering from underfunding and cutbacks through the 70s. Governor Jerry Brown had agreed to an infusion of new money to try to make that up, if you look in the archives, you'll find a book called Old Problems, New Directions, which tried to define what we needed to do to meet the needs in the state. But that promised infusion died when Prop uh, 13 passed. The 70s marked the early beginnings of seeing homeless, mentally ill persons on our streets. Family members complained that the system did not pay enough attention to their problems, that the system was too attentive to persons with less serious illnesses course correction was needed. Parents such as our late beloved Don and Peggy Richardson and Stella March, who is still a vital, lively force in the community, worked to refocus attention on persons with serious mental illness. They also taught the professionals about the significance of substance use on persons with serious mental illness. And that led to a lot of efforts to redesign the system to be more effective for such persons. In the first years, it was, you're going to get mental health service here, you'll get substance abuse service here. That didn't work. We're still struggling to meet the challenge of making a, a program that really works across the board. I worked at it. Dr. Southern has worked at it. Um, persons with co-occurring disorders remain a challenge, not the least of it because of the bureaucratic separation of funding, and that goes all the way up to the federal government. 1980s, we developed a California model with Los Angeles leadership to try to define unmet need because the state couldn't acknowledge that there was unmet need. Uh, one of the interesting things, uh, oh, I'm going to say the first, first social worker to become a mental health director in Los Angeles County, Roberto Quiros, took over in 1984 and was director until 1991. 1986, 
there was a plane crash over the city of Cerritos, and mental health launched a disaster assistance response at that time. That was the first of an ongoing series of work for the county and all of our uh, agencies to provide disaster assistance. We got very good at it after the Northridge earthquake, and I talked to one of the disaster uh, coordinators for the county this morning who said, you know, because of all the uh, structural damage after that earthquake, they haven't quite finished resolving the problems with FEMA. There are three buildings that they're still working on. Can you imagine that many years later? We got to be good at it. But one of the most touching things in the history book was written by Supervisor Don Kanabi, and it's in his foreword. He was a mayor of Cerritos when that plane crashed. And he was busy working on, on disaster risks, you know, assisting the community, doing things. But the mental health people taught him what could be expected and what would be needed. And he acknowledges that it wasn't long before he started to recognize in himself the trauma response symptoms, and he went and talked to the mental health people himself. He learned about mental health in then, and that's one reason why he has been a consistent champion of mental health in the county ever since, but it's, it's a beautiful testimony from him. Um, we had the passage of the Children's System of Care Act and a lot of improvement of our children's services in, in the county, uh, inspired by Dr. Rose Jenkins. And then we had Lieutenant Governor Leo McCarthy led an effort to help this state figure out how to put into practice what had been learned across the country of how to deal with persons with serious mental illness, how to really provide effective services. And out of that, we passed the Adult System of Care Act, AB 3777, with our, our legislative hero, Bruce Bronson, who did an awful lot for mental health while he was uh, a state legislator. Out of that legislation came pilot program money, which went to what became the village in Long Beach, which was sponsored by the Mental Health Association. And that village model put into practice what we had all learned but hadn't all done, which was to know that what people with serious mental illness needed was flexible, wrap around, whatever it takes kind of approach that recognized that they would need help with housing and jobs and social support and everything that goes up to make a normal life. And that's what they did at the village. The next major step came in 1991, a year of state fiscal crisis. Governor Pete Wilson, and you may have seen this uh, recollected in the press in recent years, recent months, he committed political suicide by supporting a state sales tax which was partly directed to finance mental health services. And that led to the passage of realignment legislation in 1991. It was a very complex financial and programmatic governance reform of California's mental health and human services. It permitted for the first time a county to shift money from state hospitals into the county managed community service network. That was a very profound change. Let me illustrate that. Before that happened, the county had a budget, but part of it was directed to its state hospital utilization and the county had no control over how many dollars went into that pot. So as we in Los Angeles had most of the state hospital beds in the state. We had over a thousand. Those costs went up. The county had to pay for it. It had a fixed allocation. So what happened? The community services had to be cut. There was no choice. Now I went to San Diego in those years, part of the demoralized group of people who were saying, what are we going to do? This is not working. We are not able to implement what we know in community mental health because of the, the way the budget is structured. Realignment changed that so that I was willing to come back and put forth a plan that was supported by the community to cut our state hospital utilization and substitute those monies for wraparound programs modeled on the village. We could cut the state hospital by 100 beds and serve 400 more people, 500 people in the community. And we could do it with absolutely the right kind of wraparound services that we knew would be effective. How did I have the guts to do that? Well, partly because San Diego had existed with 73 state hospital beds while we had over 1,000. 
San Diego is one quarter to one third the population of Los Angeles. You do the math. I knew we could do it if we had these right programs. In fact, that that was the way to move us into what would become the model for today, and that, it's, that has happened. So the success of the replica of the village led to the passage of AB 34 and AB 2034, which infused more money. And because LA had done this much, they were able to, to implement those augmentations quickly and prove that they were effective. And that was the basis for the passage of Prop 63, the Mental Health Services Act. That was the foundation of data that was that was needed, but thank goodness for realignment. Um, and then thank goodness for the Mental Health Services Act. Now I'm going to just quickly, as we talk about today and tomorrow, that is so tied into the Mental Health Services Act. If you don't know what's happening in that, I urge you to go to the Department of Mental Health website or the State Department of Mental Health website, and there's lots and lots of information. An unprecedented thousands of people have been involved in working with the department to identify the unmet needs in this community, to the, identify the unserved and underserved populations, and particularly the racial ethnic uh, members of our community who have often been totally ignored in planning and program development, not intentionally, but just as a byproduct of our limited uh, resources. The act is complex. It is intended to transform county services into systems focused on recovery and resilience with whatever it takes approach to provide goal-directed services to consumers and their families. At the same time, it provides for elements of a comprehensive mental health response for the community, which has long been ignored because of our financing problems. It includes prevention and early intervention, which is now much more sophisticated than it was when we talked about it in the 1960s. A lot of it by virtue of learning from other countries which have put into play large-scale public health efforts to identify on an early way persons with mental illness and to reduce the incidence of mental illness accordingly. There will be targeted stigma reduction efforts and funding for other elements also left out like the human resource to meet the demands that we need to serve so many more people that, that this act will make possible as well as to serve uh, so many uh, different kinds of services. It includes money for housing for getting, which we know is essential to get homeless people off the streets. Other capital and technological support such as state-of-the-art technology and medical records and prescription management and so on. So what's happened in LA so far? Uh, as I told you, the county budget right now in mental health on an annual basis is about one and a half billion. One half billion comes from the Mental Health Services Act. But there are a lot of functions that are still required that are not covered by the specialized targeted funding uses specified in the Mental Health Services Act. So while this money is designed to really leverage the existing monies to make a transformation so that the programs will in all be more effective in reducing the incidence and prevalence, the seriousness and the impact in terms of lost lives of uh, mental illness. We have 1,500 children now in full-service partnerships in Los Angeles County, about 1,100 in transitional age youth, that's young people between 18 and 25, which largely deals with the kids who've come out of the foster care system or been in probation and don't have community support systems to keep them going. We have 3,300 adults in these services and 300 and some older adults. We have uh, 1389 served in field capable clinical services, which are outreach, uh, but in between typical outpatient programs and, and the uh, full service partnerships. And one of the biggest changes is we have 6,100 clients who are being served through client run peer support and wellness centers. This is a big change in philosophy and approach. Our clients often felt devalued by mental health professionals. Frankly, some of our mental health professionals were the most stigmatizing people you could ever encounter because they would not see the hope and the need and the opportunity for recovery for persons they were serving. 
Clients have shown that they can connect better and uh, they help themselves as they help someone else. So it's a win-win situation. Big change and uh, something I am very proud of. We had a, a lead in that in LA, a starting project return in the 80s. And we've had some wonderful client leaders who have made international and national reputations come out of Los Angeles. Some of you will have heard of Pearl Johnson or Bill Compton, iconic figures um, in the client movement. We've had a lot of money come in for training and workforce development, uh, information technology, capital facilities, housing. Prevention and early event intervention is going to be allocated $131 million. It's really quite astounding. I believe that the mental health services intent to transform the system by leveraging these new monies is working. I see the breadth of knowledge of new ideas and the eager adoption of new ideas by all stakeholders. The energy across the planning and implementation efforts is remarkable. As I wrote in the dedication to the history, Los Angeles has always been best served when the people who have needed mental health assistance, their families and friends, and those who have worked tirelessly to make culturally appropriate and effective services work together to overcome frightening ignorance, deadening stigma, and crushingly inadequate funding. I think we are seeing that at its best right now, and the future of Los Angeles County is nothing but the best that I think it has ever been. And I encourage you to get to know what's going on if you don't already, and take a hand because your history, your knowledge is so vital to making, to making this all work. Thank you.